So we're about pushing boundaries here today uh, at, uh, at NASDAQ here. Uh, it's interesting to me, it's, it's hard to think about um, a more significant way of, of pushing our boundaries um, as a society and even a species than to think about um, how to uh, create new artificial partners for ourselves that allow us to uh, transcend our own uh, physical and intellectual limitations. Um, I've been working on AI uh, for a long time, uh, starting, uh, I suppose, at Stanford and a bit before uh, in a PhD career there. And AI is a discipline that uh, had a, a lot of promise and excitement in the early days, um, and then some disappointments. Uh, but right now, uh, I'm here to tell you that it's, I'm not aiming to uh, surprise or shock you, uh, but there exist today in the world uh, machines that think, uh, that can learn, and that can create. And moreover, their ability to do these things is going to increase rapidly until their abilities are coextensive with those of humanity. That was actually said by Herb Simon in 1958 uh, when he accepted an award for mathematics. Uh, Herb Simon uh, went on to win the Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, he came to artificial intelligence by trying to study how people make decisions. And it's telling of the times. Uh, he went on to predict a uh, computer would be the world chess champion uh, within 10 years. And uh, obviously got that wrong, but only by a few decades. And in, in a, a space you know, as important as this, uh, we can probably forgive that. So there was a lot of excitement uh, early on. And I talked about transcending ourselves as a species. And you know, if you look at uh, Consumer Electronics Show right now and see what's there from an AI perspective in the robot section, uh, you would think the most important thing to our species is, in fact, the dust in our carpets. Um, <laughs> so that's, there's still a long ways to go in commercializing uh, AI uh, and, and trying to find sort of what are the, the right types of applications for it. You know, I think in the, in the 50s and 60s, uh, the, the early um, practitioners and inventors of AI imagined you know, having conversations with their robot butlers, you know, playing chess with them in the morning if they were bored. And I think what we're finding is that um, uh, it, it, we're bound for disappointment if we really want to construct you know, full replacements for uh, our, the favorite humans in our lives. Uh, but there's a lot of things that we do that when you look at it, you just wonder, you know, did we really need to be human to do that? And is it even you know, worth our time to do it? Uh, so I'm, I'm sure we can put vacuuming uh, maybe in that, uh, in, that, in that segment, except part of my brain says, except for my mom, whose passion in life is vacuuming. Yeah, so, um, so when I was young, um, I, in the 70s, I mean, there was a ton of um, you know, boundary pushing in, in science fiction and popular culture around you know, what AI uh, space travel might yield. Um, as a kid, I was terribly fascinated by Star Trek and uh, you know, Spock playing chess against the ship's computer. Um, I sort of lacked the experience and uh, supplies to construct an AI system myself, uh, but I overcame that with uh, optimism of a first grader and built, <laughs> rather, I, I suppose I tried to build an AI system using uh, my Radio Shack 150 and one electronics kit and um, randomness. Uh, it, it didn't work, but it, it could have, I suppose. Um, I, uh, I got better at it over time, so at Stanford, uh, one of the early programming assignments was uh, programming a 3D tic-tac-toe system. And it was kind of interesting because uh, it's not the full Spock 3D chess, but it at least looks similar. And um, it's actually kind of hard to play as a human, uh, particularly against a computer that can fully search the game space and taunt you in ways like this and say, you, you will lose in eight moves, you, you may not see it now. And it was, uh, it was funny to be taunted. I, I wrote the program, uh, but uh, as I was playing it, I, I still was uh, inferior to it. Um, Stanford was a fun place in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, a lot of, um, it, it would be like studying physics, but at a time when uh, Newton and Gauss were still uh, you know, teaching faculty. Um, John McCarthy was uh, uh, the professor who had coined the term AI uh, a few years uh, before, and uh, was still at Stanford and happy to take a uh, lowly undergrad to lunch and explain the field and you know, where the frontiers lay. Um, one of his uh, big motives was, was trying to uh, teach computers to learn from their experience. Um, he wrote an early paper called The Advice Taker, that if only you could have a machine that uh, sort of observed, learned, and could also take advice, you could imagine that generic core uh, you know, yielding a, a lot of proficiency in its performance, whatever the performance domain was. And I think this is really important for business automation. So uh, I think among the first sort of computerized uh, business automation projects was the Hollerith tabulating machine. So in the 1890s, 
Um, we had written it into our constitution that we had to count ourselves every decade. Uh, so it was this uh, inescapable uh, sort of, uh, if you think of software engineering, right, you can shed scope or uh, change the, the, the release date. We could not uh, avoid the release date of counting everyone, so we had to build machines to do that. Uh, Hollerith uh, tabulated punch cards, you know, on which you could say, um, you know, where someone was from and uh, other stats that we needed to collect. And the machine would, uh, essentially it was a system that would store that uh, data, uh, enter it into cards, um, you know, uh, count them up, uh, once in a while. And if you look at uh, how software evolved uh, from there, even in the 2000s, um, you know, we have uh, software workflow automation tools. Uh, this, is, this is a little screenshot of salesforce.com. Um, I'm not meaning to insult the company. I, I worked there and built some of this functionality at, uh, before it went public. But Salesforce itself, uh, it's a Salesforce automation system. Um, it's a series of uh, rectangles into which you, know, you can enter letters and numbers and the system will store them, retrieve them for you, and add them up once in a while. Uh, so there is some distance in terms of uh, you know, how you access the data and enter it, but still there's not more intelligence uh, in the system. It's, it's really automating uh, the filing cabinet part of the sales process. It's not like robots are going off and selling your products for you, you know, to your customers. Um, but it is like that at a set of companies now uh, that are really using AI to fully automate you know, core parts of their business. So you think of Google, um, if, if everybody at Google went home, right, their, their web crawlers would continue to find new web pages around the world and continue to use sources of feedback to uh, optimize how those new results are displayed to users and search results. Uh, Amazon, right, they could all go home and the recommendations engines would still get smarter about which products to show to you. And my own company, Rocket Fuel, uh, which uh, serves online ads uh, as well, gets smarter all by itself without any human intervention. So, you know, I was saying in the early days, uh, they wanted robot butlers uh, that would play chess with you. I think what we're finding now is that there's a lot of uh, business problems that are pretty well circumscribed, and the kind of expertise that you need your team to build to solve them well um, is, is very specific and can be you know, machine learned where machines can achieve uh, human level or superhuman proficiency. So a lot of problems uh, look like this. So uh, there's a bunch of stuff that describes some situation, and then there's a final, uh, let's say, uh, yes or no. So you might imagine each row is someone who's applied for a loan, and then the final one zero is uh, did they pay it off successfully, or was it their distress and you know, collections efforts? Or you could imagine um, you know, credit cards. Uh, every now and, and then probably your credit card company says, we think you're, someone has taken your card. Was that you that bought gum yesterday? For me, it's, it's always been me. <laughs> so it's just a little extra overhead there. Um, or or uh, you know, for us at Rocket Fuel, um, it's, it's advertising. So the ones and zeros describe uh, the person to whom we were showing the ad and the context in which it was shown and attributes of the ad itself. And the final one or zero is, you know, did they go and, and buy Snapple in the store after seeing the Snapple ad, or maybe just respond to a survey saying, yes, I, I will think of Buick the next time I'm in market for a car. So this has been up for a while. Um, and I'll, I'll even give you a clue that the, the pattern is only based on the first five bits. Um, does anybody see the pattern? Okay, how about, a, how about a guess of what the answer is? Usually there's some smart aleck that just shouts zero or one because it's going to be one, <laughs> one of the two. Um, so it turns out that the pattern was just if there's at least three ones among the first five. Um, so what can you do with this automation? I said, you know, there's these companies like Amazon and Google and, and us uh, that are, are doing well, but um, so how do you measure doing well? Obviously Google, you can look at, at the size of that company, Amazon as well. Um, there's other companies that aren't uh, public and so they don't talk about the company level performance, uh, but they use AI for significant things. Uh, Jim Simons was the founder of Renaissance Technologies, a hedge fund uh, out in Stony Brook, and they're quite famous uh, for yielding just incredible returns over uh, decades of time. And uh, Jim himself, at least according to Forbes, uh, became just personally worth $12 billion, where there's entire funds that you know, would be investing uh, that size. Um, so it's, it's significant if you apply this correctly. And again, this is my point about business automation, right? It's, if you employ a sales automation system, maybe HR automation system, I mean, you'll expect to attain benefits, right? 10% uh, cost savings because you've got all the data together and the error rate goes down. But w when you use more, um, uh, that's sort of like a staff position, right? When you let AI be kind of more of the line position, like let it actually you know, take the ball and, and operate part of your business, uh, you know, this is the kind of results that um, you can see in different domains. I, I find this example interesting just because as I was doing research for the slides, uh, for the talk, um, of course, there's Forbes is supported by ads. Uh, we at Rocket Fuel buy some of their ad space. And so as I was looking up Jim Simons, my own company's uh, AI system was telling me maybe I want to fly uh, to Las Vegas on version America. I was actually planning to go to the J.D. Power 
uh, automotive conference in Las Vegas at the time that I was uh, putting this together. Um, so since then, I, uh, the early days, it seems like these days uh, people are more and more just expecting uh, machines to be superior. We don't, it doesn't bother us that they seem uh, patronizingly uh, you know, talking down to us as they give us directions, turn left, <laughs> just whatever, we're used to that, okay, I'll turn left. Um, you know, interestingly, just in automotive now, um, used to be a good crash test was when you smash the car into the wall and energy was transmitted such that the wheels you know, shoot out to the side and uh, nobody's legs are broken. These days, the car simply refuses to be crashed um, if you've got uh, auto brake now. Obviously, you know, someday we won't even be touching the steering wheel at all, which a lot of people think is a good thing. Um, uh, Amazon, uh, you know, you see the recommendations as a consumer, but behind the scenes in the warehouses, uh, in the old days, you can imagine somebody uh, in, working in the warehouse getting a packing list, getting on a scooter and, you know, zooming around a multiple football field size uh, warehouse trying to put the right things into the box for you. Uh, these days, the shelves containing the right items come to the packers uh, using an, a robot system uh, from Kiva. Um, you know, computers can recognize our faces now. Uh, they can handle customer support requests. Uh, they can help us in science and design antenna for spacecraft. They can help us in science and make discoveries in uh, discovering uh, sequences of genomes even. Um, this one robot is, is interesting because it, it doesn't just uh, conduct the experiments. Like we, we had medical robots, uh, let's say a decade, two decades ago, that began to be able to conduct experiments prescribed by a human scientist. This one develops its own theory space uh, envisions an experiment which would be maximally informative in terms of distinguishing uh, the confirmed hypotheses from the rejected hypotheses, and then it executes the experiment, looks at the remaining set, and continues until it finds the answer. Um, you know, we, we can send our robot ch children to Mars. Uh, you know, we need air, but they don't. Um, robots can help us now uh, extend our food supply uh, by weeding and thinning crops. Uh, they can see what's going on in our brains, which is a little Interesting, <laughs> uh, you know, bring things to us, uh, cook meals for us, uh, serve those meals to us, uh, and, and yes, yes, uh, vacuum our floors. <laughs> I just have to, if you haven't, uh, if you don't have a friend with a Nito robotic vacuum, I mean, for sure, somewhere there's a wedding happening this summer, uh, get them a Nito just so you can go to their house and watch it. It, um, it has a little uh, laser turret in the top so it can map out a room. And uh, it goes back and forth like a human might versus bouncing around randomly. Uh, when it runs out of battery, it goes back home, charges itself, and then goes right back to where it left off and uh, continues vacuuming. And that's, <laughs> this thing has been in stores, I think, for at least two or three years now. Um, you know, they, they can humiliate us on national TV. Go was going to be uh, this one game that forever it was only going to be humans that were uh, dominant at it. It was just viewed as, uh, and it's funny, every time AI solves something, it creates this question. Like, we thought that was a human thing that we used to do. Now that robots do it, all of a sudden, we're able to change our minds pretty quickly. Like, yeah, yeah, that was actually never really that big of a deal. <laughs> there's, there's this new thing that's really just for us. Uh, so in the games community, Go was sort of the next game, but uh, the trouble is even Go now, uh, computers are beating human masters. The champion is still human, but you just have to wonder you know, how long uh, that'll be the case. Oh, sorry, I pushed the button. Uh, next slide. Um, uh, this was interesting. Uh, now there's robot uh, anesthesiologists. Uh, it's not meant to assist the anesthesiologists. It, it replaces them. Uh, in a class of operations. Um, next slide. Um, some some, some follow-up reading. Uh, some cool books to automate this and race against the machine. Um, automate this gives a bunch of examples of automation going sort of farther than sort of basic automation used to go. And race against the machine is an interesting uh, piece thinking about what does it mean, uh, particularly in labor now, if machines can take on uh, more and more uh, jobs, um, will we decide it was a bug uh, that we ever created kind of a selfish society where we have to work hard uh, to get wealth, and if someone else needed it, it's too bad for them. <laughs> so uh, the more and more uh, we can automate, so I think uh, there's, there's pieces now that even say, you know, how long are CEOs safe? Um, uh, next slide. Uh, MANA is a really cool book written by a, a very successful entrepreneur, uh, actually envisioning how does AI begin to invade the workforce. And in fact, it doesn't start by replacing the workers, it starts by replacing the managers. <laughs> so that strikes fear into the heart of us all. Um, the, uh, the, the book on the right is actually, um, oops, not yet. Um, book on the, the right there was actually a book by my advisor at Stanford, Nils Nilsson. If you, those of you who are more academically inclined, it's actually a really good review of many of the academic disciplines as you kind of break AI into different pieces. So I was going to say, back to that point before about in the early days, uh, AI researchers, they, they got a little bit ahead of themselves, you know, imagining a future sort of Jetsons world uh, way too soon before we had the computational power to achieve it and being called rocket fuel. I mean, it's, it's, it's very analogous to the early days of rocketry. Um, Goddard invented liquid-fueled rockets, which because of the sort of weight-to-thrust ratios, they could go a lot farther. And uh, he told a crowd uh, that he was going to shoot a rocket to the moon. 
Uh, that was in 1923. It was amazingly audacious. We could barely fly airplanes you know, at that time. Uh, next slide. Um, he had a test flight. Uh, it didn't hit the moon. And uh, you know, lest you think a cynical press is a, is a modern innovation, uh, the Worcester Telegram in 1929 had the headline, Moon Rocket Misses Target by 238,799 and a half miles. Um, but uh, the dreamers often win in the end. Next slide. So I think uh, Goddard, uh, Goddard had the last laugh, and uh, thanks to The Onion for uh, you know, speaking truth to power. Um, next slide. All right, and so at, at Rocket Fuel, I think um, what we've been excited about is by, by using AI to uh, offload just a lot of really kind of uh, burdensome work from our customers, we get these great quotes. So literally, I, I love this one. Uh, actually, the, the longer quote was um, uh, Rocket Fuel is giving this one customer uh, the ability to uh, optimize his most important metric, uh, which was uh, being able to spend more time with his wife and young family. Next slide. So finally, uh, and that's, that's very uh, resonant with uh, my advisor, at the end of a... Uh, a conference on AI once, uh, Nils Nilsson, who was famous for inventing a, a lot of AI, including the algorithms that tell you how to drive or when to turn in your car. Um, uh, at the end of a long conference, he just kind of leans back in his chair and says, you know, the point of all this is to spend more time at the beach. So uh, that's what we're trying to do here in the AI community and um, uh, what I hope we can make some significant advances on in the next decade. Thanks.